Good, so welcome everyone to another edition of our PMF Connect, this time Monday. I'm happy to see that even though we uh, changed the day, a lot of you have joined. Um, today we have another awesome guest, which I'm going to introduce shortly. Just before I do that, um, just some information, maybe you already know something about uh, PMF. Um, if you do, I'm going to try to keep it short. If you don't, uh, there is a bunch of useful information if you want to get more um, from the things we're providing. So basically, um, PMF is a uh, conference organizer. So PMF stands for Product Management Festival, which is a conference we are organizing uh, usually two times a year. Um, this year, of course, uh, things will be a bit different. Uh, that's why we also try to do more, more things online because many of you have um, requested that. So uh, we want to keep the content sharing going. And um, there's a bunch of other resources which you can access. Um, basically the Trends and Benchmarks uh, report, which is a report completely for free with a lot of information regarding uh, salaries, psychological safety. Um, we did a survey with over 70 questions. So take the opportunity, read it. The only thing we want back from the community is uh, for you to answer next year. So uh, this report can, can keep on going from everybody contributing. Uh, uh, could I ask everybody to mute themselves uh, for, for uh, the presentation? Thank you. Um, there's a bunch of other uh, activities we're doing, so executive circles and PM nights, basically meetups for product managers or product leaders. Usually, as you can see in these pictures, these meetups take place uh, on in uh, person, but now we will as well move them online. So if you are in a location and are interested to um, know if we, there's an event in your uh, community, you can go on our website or just uh, ask me, ask uh, on the email address. If there's one around you, we can give you the details of the organizers. If there's not one around you, of course, we're always eager to have uh, people starting them. And last but not least, uh, for product managers who are interested in pursuing a leadership role, or maybe they just started one uh, with, together with INSEAD, the business school uh, uh, in Paris, we are organizing a one week, uh, it will be in person, um, one week of a program where uh, you get to study a lot of uh, organizational skills and learn how to lead uh, as a product leader which is a completely new role and um, this program is adjusted as well to the current times as uh, I bet there are a lot of new challenges um, given uh, the current international situation. That being said, um, Trends and Benchmarks report, if you're interested to download it, you can scan this QR code with your phones. Uh, if you're interested in joining our conference in Zurich, uh, it will take place on the 11th, 12th of November. As it looks right now, um, in Switzerland, things are going pretty well. Uh, so we are able to do an in-person event in, of course, respecting all the uh, safety conditions. Um, and Oh. It gives me a lot of pleasure to uh, introduce uh, AJ. AJ is the head of strategic growth at SG. He will speak there about the essentials of driving exponential growth. Um, he has been in the, he has been working in tech since over 10 years uh, starting in engineering and then moved to product uh, he uh, previously worked for app dynamics which, where he led mobile and iot uh, this is a company which actually got sold to cisco for over the 370 million US dollars, so quite a successful uh, turnout. Um, and AJ has uh, um, 
has uh, finished also an MBA at UC, UC Berkeley. So he uh, has a lot of knowledge, a lot of experience, um, a lot of interesting tips on how to um, bring and drive the exponential growth inside your product. So AJ, thank you very much for taking the time to speak to us. I know it's super early in the morning for you as you're based in San Francisco. Thank you again for, uh, for putting in the effort. Absolutely. Hey, everyone. I hope everyone's doing well. Thank you, Lulia. Uh, let me go ahead and share my screen. Uh, one second. There we go. And if this allows me. Cool. All right. Uh, as I said, thank you, Lilia. Uh, just minor correction there. AppDynamics sold to Cisco for $3.7 billion. A slightly higher number than the, the million dollar number. Uh, so, so it turned out all right for, for AppDynamics. We we'll talk about a short story there. Um, this is such a weird setup, talking online. I almost feel like I'm presenting to a screen. Uh, so if I look too boring, sorry about that. It's about 3 a.m. here. I'll try not to sleep. Uh, but it's, it's great to see everyone here. Uh, and it's great to, to be talking about growth. This is a, a topic I'm quite passionate about. Uh, I've been doing this for, for a long time now. Uh, so let's jump right into it. Uh, and as we, as we get into it, I have a quick question just to get a sense of the audience here, which is uh, I would love to understand if you work on the B2C product or B2B product, you don't have to be a product manager, but I'm just curious what kind of industry you are in. Uh, so feel free to, to put in your polls in, in here. Okay, uh, who's AJ? Uh, AJ loves biking. If, if you like biking, uh, I would love to connect more. Uh, maybe we can ride away. Uh, but on, on career side, uh, I love to, to turn ideas into businesses. Uh, I, I pride myself in, in taking something from zero to one and one to 50. Uh, so I helped uh, Snapfish uh, build their mobile checkout process from ground up. And then when I became product manager, uh, we turned the growth from 27% conversion to 60% conversion over a couple of years. I also helped uh, App Dynamics throw their mobile monitoring business by 20x. As, as Lilia mentioned, that, that was quite an exit a couple of years ago. Uh, and then the IoT product at App Dynamics, this was just an idea in something that was at zero. Somebody said, hey, this is very raw. Uh, we should do something in this area. And then we launched the product, started to, to generate some early dollars. And these days I, I focus on uh, more on the growth side for, for Sentry. Uh, so I'm responsible for heading that department and coming up with ways where we can exponentially grow our user base. Um, now, I realize that uh, not everybody may be familiar with Sentry. Uh, it's a, it's a US-based firm, uh, which is not a B2C uh, company. And, B2B companies often are not as popular in terms of their brand. Uh, so just want to quickly talk about uh, Sentry. Uh, it's primarily a developer product. There are more than a million developers across the world who use the product. Um, it's an open source mo application monitoring. So if you have a software application, it tells you the health of that application on a real time basis. Um, the customers include Disney, so if you have heard about Disney Plus, uh, that's all based on Sentry. If you have used GitHub to write your code, um, that, that uses Sentry across the company, Dropbox, Microsoft, on and on, Uber and Airbnb. It's essentially uh, a long list of, of quite branded in here. Um, we help developers, as I said, identify performance issues in their code. And our primary monetization channel is, is self-serve. So, uh, although we are B2B company, uh, we are much more self-serve kind of organization where somebody comes to the website, they, they try it out, and if they like it, they can continue to use it and eventually purchase it. Uh, that's it. So if I look at the poll number, seems like uh, I, I'm quite surprised, actually. I, I 
I thought the more of the audience would be B two C, uh, but it's it's great to see that uh, that more of an audience here seems more B two B. It will help as well as as we go through the conversation. Uh, I can highlight some of the the specific tips for for B two B businesses. So thanks for sharing uh, where you come from. All right, let's move on. So before we we dive into some examples so, so the plan i have is i'm going to talk about the fundamentals of growth so setting a baseline setting uh, a stage for where everybody can uh, can follow the terminology and we are going to look at some examples of so, uh, one of the examples is how we grew growth at century by about 20 percent uh, compounding month over month uh, and then we are going to go look deeper beyond the optimizations and some examples there as well. So <clears throat> let's jump into the, the fundamentals here. Okay, uh, so uh, traditional growth is defined as optimizing user activation funnel to grow user count. Uh, by the way, I hope a lot of these fundamentals some something you already know, uh, but again, it's just to bring a same stage for everyone. Uh, so it's a straight line growth. You constantly make optimizations, be it onboarding process, be it sign up, be it changing some buttons on the, on the welcome page, home page, uh, your website. You're constantly making those changes and adjusting, hoping for <clears throat> slight bit of an uptick in, in your optimizations for growth. Now, I see growth as a function the, to deliver continuous growth on a specific metric. So, so it's not just about, hey, I'll, I'll go and change a little bit of something in, in onboarding process because I feel like it, you, we can provide better experience. I think it's beyond experience. You start with a, with a specific metric and you, you try to deliver quarter over quarter growth on that. So we'll talk more about that in a second. Uh, uh, the, the universal truth of product funnel, it's, it's no different. Everybody knows about it. Uh, it starts with user acquisition. Now the user acquisition could come from a marketing side with paid uh, ads or could come from sales and marketing motion in the B2B world where you're actually doing a direct sale. Uh, it could come organically somebody landing on your website as well. Uh, but a large part of acquisition actually starts when somebody lands on your website or when they start trying your product then there is a user activation this goes through sign up and somebody actually going through the, uh, the funnel of activation an example from a p2c world is instagram for example when you sign up they ask you to follow a certain number of friends certain number of post a picture like certain other pictures um, that's all part of activation so, so you can get to a stage where you have a high chance of staying in that application for a B2B product, that activation looks like um, a sales enablement person uh, or a specific uh, POC uh, happening in your environment. You're trying that product for, for a certain period of time and then deciding on whether you want to continue to use it or not. Um, so uh, that's activation. Then retention, you're constantly delivering value, otherwise people fall off. Uh, and then monetization is eventually when you start uh, to get somebody a feeling that they can they should pay for this product and they eventually end up paying. This thing is the polls. I think we are close. We can go past that. All right. So uh, now we always start with the with your target metric. This is. Uh, I think this is quite normal, but it's also how I look at product development stages. Uh, so a question uh, I would love to understand from your environments, what kind of product development stages do you follow? I'll talk about mine. I would love to see what the difference is. And towards the end of the, this conversation, I'll just look at those results. So I always start with the target metric. As I said, it's super important that quarter over quarter, at the start of a quarter, you're deciding what metric you're going to target. Uh, then you understand all the impacting factor uh, for those uh, for that specific metric. And uh, then you research what are the biggest gaps and what are the biggest opportunities to move that metric. Uh, you Once you have come up with that, you implement changes. 
and then after implementing the changes, you measure and, and iterate. So that's that's quite typical of product managers and, and product development stages. Right. We'll we'll look at an example there in a second. Okay. Uh, all right. So that's all on the fundamentals. <laughs> Quick and and dirty, uh, but we'll we'll just dive right into an example. So I joined Sentry. I would say exactly a, a year ago now. Um, and one of my first thing was, uh, or my first responsibility was, hey, you're here, you're responsible for this, this particular function in the company, go figure out how do, you, how do we grow user base. Uh, so we drove in our first project about 20% compounding growth at Century. So I, I'm gonna talk about how we went about it. Uh, so first of all, we, we chose a, a target metric here. Uh, our target metric was monthly active users. Now, as we saw in our uh, one of the previous slides in the stages, you first start with the target metric and then you understand what are the things that impact those that specific metric. So we are going to start with the MAUs. Uh, and then the, the things that impact MAUs are, uh, in my mind, at least new users. So you can get net new users. They, they were not part of the, they weren't using your product before, they didn't purchase your product before, so they are net new to the to your product line. Um, or you can have the existing users, but you can activate more users. So if you got 100 people on your website, but you uh, to sign up, and but you can only convert 30 of them in the past to, to actually use the product. Uh, well, now you can try to change that number and, and activate more users. And then the last one is retain. So if, if you retain more users they are gonna keep coming back to your product and hence your monthly active users will be higher. Uh, so we focus on new users and we'll talk about why we went that route. Um, then uh, we looked at what are the things that impact new users. So in order to increase the count of new users, we can go one of these three routes. We can either generate more referrals so people can uh, refer Sentry to, to other folks. Uh, we can obviously run ads. Uh, we can also do organic search improvement. Uh, but the last two are more on the marketing side and less on the, the product side. So, so we'll focus more on referrals here. And then we, as we looked at referrals, uh, there are three ways, uh, the three primary ways we looked at uh, of driving referrals. One is invitations. The second is word of mouth and third is part, third party referrals. Third party referrals, other websites kind of redirecting people to, to your website. If you have a good brand name that organically happens, word of mouth, Sentry was quite popular in word of mouth. In fact, we see that 70% of users come through because somebody said, uh, somebody, one developer told other developer that you should do Sentry, it's a great car. Um, so so the, the third really the thing that we can change and what was the biggest gap was invitations. We thought that's where we can make the biggest difference. And if we change that invitations count or increase the invitations count, that will eventually uh, lead to more monthly active users. So that's how we initially started thinking about invitations. That's, uh, well, growth is n nothing without some numbers. Uh, so uh, we looked at some of the metrics. Um, if you use Amplitude, by the way, these charts are from Amplitude. I like their product, but I'm, they haven't paid me to say that. <laughs> that's where these graphs come from. Uh, the numbers have proved, uh, the, the numbers prove that our focus should be invitations. Uh, I'll say why. Uh, first of all, invitations are a great way to build viral growth. If you can get more people to invite other folks, then those more folks will invite other folks and it eventually kind of leads to compounding growth. So, so this is what, our, what things looked like last year. I've removed some numbers because of confidentiality of the, of the company, uh, but this was the trend. It was mostly constant. The blue line here represents number of invited members. And the green line represents uh, the number of people who actually accepted those invites. So um, if, if there were 100 invites, uh, then 75 of those people accepted the invite. So we thought that that's a great opportunity because um, there is 75% conversion. That means if we can get people to increase the number of invites, then there will automatically be more people joining the organization 
and it's a pretty good conversion. So, so we don't need to improve the conversion, we just need to increase the number of people sending these emails. Okay. So that's where we started on, the, and the, the, this is what the numbers looked like last year. As you can see, it's exactly a year before, um, which is when I joined the company. All right, so uh, now that, that's metric. Let's look at what changes we can make. So in, in terms of experience. So status quo was, we had good old way of sending invites. You can be in set, you can go to settings, you can go to members and then send some invites. Uh, only owners and admins could invite. Now, obviously, otherwise it will pollute uh, by everybody sending invites. And only one member at a time can, can send invites. Uh, or if, sorry, you, you can only invite one member at a time. So if you wanted to invite 10 members, you would have to go through this four 10 times. It's not a good experience, obviously. So, uh, so new world looks like following. Uh, we, uh, we created a way where anyone can send invites. Now, if obviously, if members are sending invites, uh, admins need to approve the, those invites. And, uh, and then you can invite multiple people at the same time. So you can keep on adding those invites so you don't have to go through the same room uh, multiple times. So this was one part of, of the change we made. This is uh, to say, how can we increase the number of invites that people send? That wasn't enough. We, we, we didn't stop there. And we, we asked ourselves, why, can't, why does somebody else need to invite you? Why can't you invite yourself? And, and that was a big part of our change as well. We thought that there could be a way where you can request to join an organization. And so if somebody approves, well and good, you don't have to go to somebody else to say, hey, can you invite me? Right. So, so we added that button there, uh, which said uh, a request to join. Now, once you make the change, uh, you obviously, uh, as an uh, any product development person, product manager, growth person, um, it, you obviously run some A/B tests. Uh, but you don't obviously select low, lower growth rate. Uh, but we ended up selecting lower growth rate. Uh, I will explain why we chose to select lower growth rate versus a higher growth rate here. So uh, on the left side, uh, we are looking at a, uh, at a graph where percentage accepted invites uh, relative to baseline. So remember we had that 100x and, and 75x number. Now this is that representing that 75x. So on the baseline, which is our old way of doing things, there are 100 people uh, who were accepting invites. Uh, when we just did the request to invite, which was the first part of change we made, uh, there were 11% improvement. Request to join, which was the second part of uh, change we made, about 9% improvement. But if we did both of those, uh, it, it jumped by 21%. Right? This was about a couple months, or I would say three months after the uh, launching the, the feature. So, uh, so that's the left side. Now, obviously, in, in looking at that, you would choose both, which is 21% uh, improvement on baseline. Now, on the right side, uh, the, the graph represents uh, percentage users who became active in the last 30 days. So this is really, if you remember the metric we were after, this is the monthly active users. Uh, so, so in this, now, if you look at, it's, it's quite an interesting outcome. You, you see the, the specific change, the, the request to invite, making about 7% improvement. Versus if you did uh, both, uh, there were only about 2 to 3% improvement. Now, we, we, we still went with both. And the reason for that was, uh, if you look at the previous graph, the more there are more people sending invites. So even if the number of uh, people becoming active out of it are, is smaller, the overall absolute number is higher. So that's why we ended up choosing a lower growth rate on MAU, but it eventually actually was a higher growth absolute number, which is really what we care about. We, we want more people to join Sanctuary. I hope that makes sense so far. If there are questions, by the way, we'll, we'll have enough time for that towards the end of it. There are a couple okay. of questions already on the chat. Okay. Should I look at them now? 
somebody was asking uh, how did you measure word of mouth mario okay. yeah we can talk about it towards the end of it i think it's uh, perfect. perfect i'll talk about some of the things okay uh, okay so so we looked at this example this was about 20 percent growth as i said in number of invitations uh, about two to three percent growth out of them in um, in monthly active users which is a if you look at more than 150,000 monthly active users that's a significant number month over month that's compounding to each other but i would say that's just optimization right? we often get into this this habit of um, just making minor changes to the product and hoping that the results are bigger but they never actually are so so i want to uh, to say the, the optimizations are not enough. We need to focus on exponential growth. If we just keep growing in a straight line, we are not doing enough. There needs to be more exponential curve. And the way you get to exponential curve is by doing growth focused innovation. It's a quite a heavy term. So, so let me uh, say a few words about what that may mean. Uh, the way I define growth focused innovation is you take risks. Uh, you take risk towards a specific target metric. And when you take risk, sometimes that risk plays out well. So your, your growth goes straight up, but often that, uh, that risk just falls flat. And when it falls flat, uh, you don't change anything. But over a long term period, uh, it starts to bend your curve more towards the exponential growth. Uh, we'll look at an example of how I've done that in, in my uh, past life as well. Uh, now, in order, as I said, in order to take risk, you got to think outside the box, think big, think beyond product, think solve new problems, target new user bases, change user behavior. Um, one of the things we are doing at Sentry these days is we are looking at net new uh, community. We are looking at serverless environments where a lot of developers are now writing their code on, on cloud in serverless functions. And... Uh, we don't have a huge adoption there. So we're not looking growth as changing existing product, but how can we build product for uh, and, and bring these uh, serverless developers into our funnel. So, so that's an example of, of um, targeting a user base. Right. So again, the framework I use, uh, which is quite similar to product, development but uh, but it applies to more of a business setting so you gotta think beyond product development here uh, you focus on key business opportunities so you start with the vision you define what your business goal is uh, the next thing you do is you, you look at what are the different strategies or what are different paths to get to that particular goal right so if, if you are trying to target and net new users uh, one of the ways could be you just do more of a marketing to those users, or another way could be you make a net new product or you add an additional feature. Uh, and third is you just um, do more of sales and marketing. So there could be many different ways uh, to get to, to that business goal. You, you select which one makes sense for you and your organization and aligns with the, uh, with the company goals. And then finally, you execute on a specific tactical plan. Let's look at, Let's take a look at an example here. So uh, uh, this, is, uh, this is an example of where I was working on mobile monitoring solution for, uh, for AppDynamics. Uh, this was a company that got sold to Cisco. Uh, we grew the mobile monitoring in about three and a half years by 20X uh, and 20X in revenue, not, not just the users. So it was a real dollars that, that we grew. Now, growth mobile monitoring business, uh, our, our initial business goal was to grow the mobile monitoring business. When I joined that company, my manager said, hey, we, we don't know how to grow the mobile business, that's your responsibility. So that, that's the goal we started with. Now, things that I could have made changes in was product improvement. Maybe the product is not as good and hence not a lot of people use it. Um, and when I did my research, it didn't seem like product was all that bad. It was, I mean, you can make some fine tuning, but, but it was fairly fine. And sales and marketing, uh, maybe the, we are not doing, we are not marketing the product enough and hence uh, not a lot of people use mobile monitoring. 
And then finally, product education. Um, and I, it turns out in my research that that was the biggest gap, that that's where we can make change. So, so we use the strategy where we are going to amp up our uh, product education around mobile monitoring. So we, we did the, uh, this is more of a B2B example, as I said. Uh, we did the internal sales enablement, generated a lot of content. We constantly brought sales people into San Francisco headquarters and, and educate them on how to talk about mobile monitoring. What are the key features? What's our value? propositions um, in fact uh, when we did the external part I went along on sales pitches I became their salesperson uh, so they can uh, see how can we uh, how can we talk about this product well uh, and we also generated some some external content so uh, doing that led to that was the large part of what led to to this uh, huge growth in, in our mobile monitoring business. Now we continue to improve the product over that, that time period as well. Okay, let's... Uh... Let's go next. I've talked enough about my own experience. I wanna take pick some examples about industry as well. Uh, so you, you, hopefully everyone has used Facebook. Uh, so Facebook uh, growth curve uh, looks like this, or this is what it looked like. It started from 2004. Up, uh, the numbers are up to about close to 2017. If you can see in here, um, they, they had quite a bit of jump around 2008. And that's around the time that they release new news feed, uh, like scalable platform. Uh, if you look at any of these, these features, <clears throat> none of them, are about making slight modifications to existing product. Uh, it's newsfeed was net new product, rethinking how, how people use, changing people's behavior, which is one of the things we talked about. Uh, likes was a completely new idea of how somebody would use the product. Uh, and a scalable platform was absolutely needed if they wanted that huge growth. Uh, also, I'm not sure if you have, uh, um, Again, these two are B2C examples. I don't know if you have heard about Airbnb's uh, cross-posting cross hack with the Craigslist. So you can imagine when, when, uh, when Airbnb was starting, it's a marketplace. Uh, there are people who are posting their home for, uh, for short-term rental, and there are people who are then renting those places. But the biggest problem is that as a startup or as a small company, you don't have any listings. And if you don't have any listings, nobody would come and rent listings from you. So what, what Airbnb ended up doing was they said a lot of people, at least this is true for US and I guess now they're across the world, uh, a lot of people use Craigslist. And Craigslist was where uh, it's an open source, uh, free to use product where people just post their rentals and, uh, and other people come in and try to rent them. What Airbnb did was they figured out and backtracked their API. So they, they started getting all the listings that were on Craigslist based on certain filters into Airbnb. Now they had a lot of listings. Uh, and then when they had a lot of listings, they could get a lot of people to, to come in and start renting. Well, it's, uh, I know that the valuation of Airbnb in this year has dropped. Uh, it's sad with what's going on around here. Um, but uh, still pretty hefty valuation at about $18 billion. Um, so that's what Airbnb did. But the point here is uh, that the growth doesn't always come from making minor changes, but rethinking and taking risk. Okay, uh, so I'll, I'll, uh, I'll end this by saying, uh, don't stop at the product. Right? Uh, product is just piece, one piece of the puzzle. Think big and focus on specific business metrics. When you take risk for that business metric, uh, that's when you see those uh, those exponential growth curves. Okay. With that said, I would stop talking. Thank you for listening. Thank I you can very imagine, much. Yeah, I can imagine the voice being terrible around <clears throat> this time of the hour. Uh, I'll open up the chat, but uh, but thank you everyone for listening.
Thank you. That was very interesting. And already people are asking me if we can share the recording because they want to look more in depth at it. I think there's a, a lot of useful tips which they can use. So. Uh, that's great. Uh, yeah, I would. Uh, you can share the recording. Uh, also, feel free to connect with me over, I don't know, LinkedIn, Instagram. Uh, if, if you're on there, uh, I'm happy to chat more about this topic. I'm deeply connected <laughs> to this topic and care a lot about it. Uh, but, but we can jump into uh, into, que uh, into questions here. All right, so let's see. The first one I see here is how did we how did we measure word of mouth? So uh, we we did a few things, uh, and it's a multi-part kind of research. So one part of the research was uh, more subjective, which is when people come to to Century uh, and they, they use for a certain time period, we we send them a survey, and in that survey we ask them how did you hear about Century the first time. And, and they, often the answer is we heard from somebody else who used Sentry. Uh, but what, what we also did was, uh, I mean, that could be a quite a long process. So what we did was we looked at what are the, the search terms people are using uh, on Google. So if they were using, if they had Sentry in their search term, the, that told us in, in many cases that they had heard about Sentry from somewhere else. Uh, that, that that's why they knew the name Sentry, uh, and we we also put that under the the category of word of mouth. Uh, so that's how we we calculated it, <clears throat> and then the, the the third piece, which is again more subjective, we went to conferences, <clears throat> and when we when people stopped by the booth, we asked them, hey, why did you stop by, and have you heard about Sentry, and how did you hear about it? So the, those were the the three different buckets we we put people in. I hope that answers the question. Uh, <clears throat> let's uh, let's go to the next one. Uh, do you work on another experiment while waiting thirty days for the experiment? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we at any given time we have say somewhere around four to five experiments running. Uh, however, uh, we don't run the experiments on the same piece of the product. So we would have one experiment running on the, the home landing page of Sentry, so Sentry.io, uh, which will be more about A-B test, just adjusting some messaging and stuff like that. Uh, we would have another on, on a feature we just worked on, uh, another on, on a previous feature we worked on. But we, when, we run, when we run an experiment, for example, in this case in invitations, we don't try to make any other changes to that flow. Uh, so so uh, the other experiments don't pollute this, this specific part. But there can always be some overlap. For example, if we change onboarding flow uh, and uh, we also change the invitations flow, it is possible that more people are coming to onboarding in a certain part of experiment and, and those, are the, those happen to be the segment that sends more invite. But as long as the story overall is positive, we are happy to take it. Um, so... Okay, so that's uh, hopefully that answers that question. Um, we can uh, as well, uh, ask uh, the people who ask the questions to unmute themselves. So um, if you want to. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I should have uh, followed that. Yeah, that was my question and you answered it. So thank you. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, can you repeat about why you chose the lower growth rate? Yeah, so um, it, it's funny, but let's take a simple example here. So we, we started with, let's say, 100 people who were at the baseline of, of sending invites. Right? Um, on one part of the experiment, we saw about, I, remember, I don't remember exactly, but maybe about 10% improvement. So there are 10% improvement. Um, now there are 110 people sending invites. Right. Uh, and another part of experiments we saw 21% improvement. So there are about <clears throat> 121 people sending invites. Now, what we really cared about was uh, how many monthly active users are we creating out of this? So even though 110 people had about 7% conversion, the, the absolute percentage of 121, of uh, uh, let's say 3%, was higher than 7% in absolute numbers. Uh, now, 
I'm just making up some numbers here because of com confidentiality uh, of the company. But, but that was the reason the, the, uh, the lower percentage of a higher number uh, happened to be higher in this case, and hence we selected lower growth rate. But in the absolute numbers, it was actually a higher growth rate. Okay, makes sense. Uh, thank you. Thank you for answering that question. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, okay, recording. Yes, we can absolutely share that. Um, I'm also, by the way, I'm also happy, as I said, to, to talk about it if you want to jump deeper into any of these things. Um, how do you manage your external content distribution? <clears throat> Uh, how do you choose which target audience to educate about Sentry products? Uh, yeah, so that example was from AppDynamics, but uh, I'm happy to talk about both Sentry and, and AppDynamics. So AppDynamics was a, was a direct sales company. We had very little of self-serve users coming to the product. So it was almost, I would say, 95% of the users uh, where our salespeople reached out to somebody and said, hey, you should try this product. These are the benefits you get. The challenge when I got to the company was um, they were talking about the core product, which wasn't the mobile product. It was uh, a backend product or backend monitoring, but they weren't talking about mobile monitoring in there. Right? So, so my job was to educate our, uh, our salespeople. Now for the external content distribution, uh, we did very typical of things just because what I found was we were not doing typical stuff. For example, one pager, like if, if salespeople can send out these one pagers of why mobile monitoring is important to them and how AppDynamics mobile monitoring is going to help them day to day, um, it's going to uh, make a difference. So we had some of the good brands <clears throat> before. Uh, I think I remember uh, from Europe, we had Lloyds, uh, we have uh, we had HSBC Bank as customers, so we use their their brands as well. And then we ended up acquiring companies like United Airlines, uh, CNN, um, Match.com, some of essentially the biggest brands as well. Um, we and then the other part of the the content that we constantly send out was. Uh, videos. We, we sent out the videos which were less than one minute long. Uh, one talking about the value proposition, second talk about how to use the product, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, again, we, I worked with product marketing to develop those, uh, those education materials here. On Sentry, uh, it's quite different. Uh, Sentry is more of a self-serve uh, audience. So 80% of the business comes from self-serve users. That means uh, for external content, everything needs to live on the website and YouTube and social channels and stuff like that. Uh, so we are quite active on Twitter. We are quite uh, active uh, on our website. We have a forum uh, and communities. Um, so, and we are also open source products. So we are quite active on GitHub as well. People are constantly contributing code to us. Does that answer your question, Avina? Yeah, thanks. Uh, just a follow-up question. Um, do you often find yourself have to constantly adjust your external content uh, to fit Absolutely. with your customers? Absolutely. I, and thanks for bringing that up. I would say any part of growth, including this piece, there is nothing constant. Actually, that's what I like about this, uh, about being in growth job is that things are very dynamic. You're constantly measuring. So when I talk about that one pager, we send it out to, uh, 10 of the, the large companies, we see what the response is, we adjust it, we, we try to do it again. And if the one pager doesn't work, we invite them to uh, a night where we get all the CIOs together, talk to them uh, in, a, in a small room. Uh, that's also part of external education content. And we do a bunch of other things. So we are constantly uh, doing these things, measuring and readjusting. And that's uh, as we looked at in some of the examples through the presentation, uh, it's all about numbers for me. It's, it's about numbers because it's such, growth is such an ambiguous topic that if you're just constantly building features, you, you lose sense of what you're actually making, if you're actually growing or making a difference. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, all right, so another question from Lulia. <laughs> Uh, can you talk a little more about product education and mobile monitoring space? For example, you mentioned your research pointed out 
focus on this avenue? How did you evaluate that? What were some of the challenges in leading to the sales team? Um, I think we talked a little bit about that topic, but I can talk more about the challenges in getting to the sales team. Yeah, just we've already touched up uh, on some of the education materials and approaches. So I think from my point of view, we're maybe in a similar situation in my company, uh, Beekeeper, where we're pivoting a little bit um, our space and like how does that relationship with with sales and some of the challenges maybe that you've come across in, in the education, like re-educating, let's say, um, what the product is and, and how it should be sold. I'd appreciate more. Yeah. Um, again, I think this is a topic we can talk at a length about, so, so happy to chat after as well. But a uh, few things that I did, which, were, which I saw was super important. One, I got a buy-in from a uh, leadership team first. I, I, if, if you make a priority for a leadership team that, hey, if you want me to grow the mobile monitoring business, then you gotta help me grow that business this is where the biggest gap is. Uh, so when I got the leadership team to agree that the biggest gap is product education, I showed them some examples of when salespeople, for example, make a call, what do they talk about in their first 30 minutes or first hour or first meeting? And they were not talking about mobile monitoring at all. It was a clear example that if we don't tell somebody that our product, we have this product, then nobody's gonna buy it. Um, the other was we, we looked at what kind of people these sales folks were bringing to the table. And often they were not bring, bringing uh, people who were responsible for mobile, mobile applications within their companies. And if you don't bring people who are responsible for that part of the organization, they're not gonna buy or understand the value. Uh, so uh, the, the internal challenges we had within AppDynamics says there are always more products to talk about than you can, uh, uh, the, and you can focus on within within a few minutes or within, within first meeting. So we, uh, but if you can, uh, or we did a few things. One, buy the leadership buy-in. Second, we also discussed, hey, if you if you sell this product more, you're gonna make more of a commission. That's something I, um, often sales is kind of, uh, I shouldn't say that, but, but coin operated. And then that's what their motivation is. That's where their, their commission comes from. So that was part of it. Uh, and then the third piece, which was, if I can convince salespeople that this is a good product that actually, if you tell somebody that they are going to buy it, they're obviously going to sell it because all they're trying to do is uh, sell, the, sell a product and make money as quickly as possible. So uh, well, one of the biggest challenges internally within AppDynamics was people didn't even know that we had a good product and that it could actually sell well. So if, if they had low confidence on the product, they, they wouldn't sell it. Um, so, so we, uh, in my pitch to them, I proved to them why this is a great product and how it differentiates with all the competitive products out there. Um, so, uh, so talking about that and giving them that confidence uh, that they were able to, uh, to talk more about it. And as I said, like I went on some of the trips with them. I, I you know, became the salesperson for them to actually show them that yes, this actually works. Uh, okay, so does that answer your question? Uh, yeah, thank you very much for sharing. I feel like that's a, a lot we could learn from. That's good. Cool. Uh, all right, thank you. Uh, don't see other questions. I think we are good. Lulia, do you have any final thanks? Um, I think that's it, uh, but... Uh, Can we ask uh, one more live question? Of course. <laughs> so, it seems there's many uh, B2B uh, people here. One thing we constantly struggle with is statistical significance. Because if you've got 10 customers or 100 customers or something, you'll never get statistical significance. Whereas if you're in the B2C space, you have more opportunity um, to do this. So, I'm just wondering, how do you handle this challenge? Yeah, uh, so as I said, I think uh, on the on the Sentry side, we are lucky that we have such a large user base, as I said, million plus developers, so it's it's easy to, to get to statistical significance. Uh, it was quite a bit of a challenge on the AppDynamics side. We we had companies who would pay us million plus dollars per, per purchase in, in many cases, but there were very few of them. Uh, so in, in that case, uh, it, we, we paid, there's no magic to it. We didn't 
pay as much attention to statistical significance. We paid a lot more attention to uh, subjective nature of what we are trying to solve. So, uh, for example, one of the, uh, I remember one of the features we worked on and mo mobile monitoring is, is showing people what their screen flows look like. So, so for example, if you have an error on your application, uh, we actually automatically showed them, this is what user did. So, so these are steps they followed in, in your application. And uh, uh, we, when we launched it, we saw, and we talked about it, we saw maybe 10, uh, 10 companies using it. It wasn't much, but we got a, uh, we, we went to each one of them. Uh, when you have fewer customers, it becomes much more easier to go to them and talk to them. Uh, they're, they're, you have a direct connection with them. <laughs> and that, that made it easier because we could talk to them. And what we learned was it's a, it's a great feature to, uh, to talk about, but it's not a great feature to use. Uh, it's actually, in, <laughs> the story is a negative story. So we learned that it creates a lot of privacy concerns and, and uh, people often keep that feature off. So when we were selling it, it was selling very well because we could differentiate compared to our competitors. And everybody thought that they could use the, the feature. But when they actually went to use the feature, their security team said, hey, stop, you can't actually see what users are doing on the application. So, so they, they always kept that feature off. So what we learned was it wasn't helpful and uh, we stopped developing further on that particular feature. Uh, but yeah, I think that to answer your question, it becomes much more subjective, but I actually like that piece uh, that you can talk to real humans, like numbers can only go so far. Uh, they are helpful when you have masses, but when you don't have masses, you gotta live with uh, more of people's feeling and how they're using it and what they're doing in their environments. Thank you. Cool. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much, AJ. Thank I you, everyone. It was, uh, it was great to, to connect with you all. Uh, I hope to see you again soon on one of these uh, PM nights or conferences. Thanks for joining. Um, if uh, people want to connect to you, they can reach out on LinkedIn or... Yeah, yeah. feel free to send it out on LinkedIn. Uh, maybe mention PMF in, in one of the, the, the messages that would help me accept the invite. Cool. But, Looking forward to it. Cool. Uh, I think this was super interesting. Uh, I'm happy to see so many questions. Uh, I took some notes. I, I think the, the learnings are great. Uh, we're going to share the video after. So if you want to watch it again, um, uh, stay tuned for a link from us. And um, we're going to be organizing another uh, PMF Connect soon. There's going to be an announcement coming up on email. Uh, and until then, enjoy your day, enjoy your week, enjoy your growth. And um, see you soon. Thank you, everyone.